Do you have an emergency food pantry? And how do you know what to put in your emergency food pantry? Hi, I'm Hope. And I'm Larry. From Under the Median. Each week on this channel, we talk about practical frugality. So if that's something you'd love to know more about, make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell notification button. We have received a lot of views on a video that we did several months ago where we gave you 20 essential things that you should have in your pantry right now now. And I think, I think about um, eight of them were non-food items and 12 were food items. And there've been a lot of questions that have been uh, sent our way from viewers in relation to that video. Now, some of those questions are what spawned this new series. This is the first in a three-part video series where we're going to talk to you about what to put in your pantry. How do you know what even goes in there? And then once you get the food in there, how do you store it? And then how in the world are you supposed to even create meals just based on what's in your pantry? So that's an overview of the three-part series. We'll be covering it for the next three videos. In today's video, we'd like to give you for your consideration, we'd like to give you four criteria that you need to ask yourself when you're looking at an item, you're in the store, something's in your hand and you're like, should I buy this for my emergency food pantry or should I not buy this? We're gonna give you criteria upon which you can for sure base that decision. And then we're gonna cover five golden rules of food storage. So let's get started. Mm -hmm. Well, we're gonna work on the four most important factors to take into consideration before buying any item in your emergency pantry. And the first one is shelf stability. That's very important for storage. Not all things are equal as far as shelf stability is concerned. So one of the things you need to really think about when you're looking at something, you're in that store, it's in your hand, think about how long is this realistically going to last on my pantry shelf. And we've talked a lot on this channel about the fact that, especially with like um, foods that are not processed, foods that are fresh foods, how once a week, Larry and I make a list of all of the items that are in the house that are fresh foods. And we, we base a menu on what is on the shelves of our refrigerator and sitting on the counter. And then we make sure we're using things up in the order in which they will go bad and become unusable. So your pantry, I want you to think of it a little bit like that. You have some items sitting in your pantry that are going to be used before other items. So if something's going to last, say, three months on your pantry shelf, it doesn't mean you shouldn't buy it as opposed to something that's gonna last, say, two years. You just need to be aware of it. That's why it's super important to know exactly what's in your pantry at all times. Now, if you'd like to have like a, a checkoff list of items that we keep in our pantry and we really recommend for pantries, then we actually have a free pantry workbook and it's available. There's a link in the description of this video. So look at it and ask yourself, how shelf stable is this? Now, part of that comes down to knowing some things will last longer than others. Yeah, for instance, canned goods last a long time. And I would suggest when you're putting <laughs> any item into your pantry for storage, that you put the date that you purchased it. That will give you a reference point on how long that you've had it in there. And how long it takes you to use. The second date that Larry and I really like to add is when that item is opened and we start to use it, we put that date on there too. So we know how long it lasted us. For instance, uh, we don't use maple syrup now as much as we used to in the past. But when we were using a lot of maple syrup, we would go through 32 ounces of maple syrup. Yes, I'm not kidding, in one month. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. we, But we knew that. We knew that pattern. So once we opened something, we went, okay, we know. 30 days from now, we're going to want to make sure there's more maple syrup um, that, on the pantry shelves. So that's equally important. So you want two dates in mind, right? 
when you purchased it. That's important because you want to rotate your stock. The second date that you want is when you opened it. Now, of course, if it's canned goods, you know, you're going to use it all up in one fell swoop, right? Right, right. But there are some other things like flour or sugar, something like that. It's going to take you well, a while. Well, when we open uh, coffee, I'll, I'll put a date on it. And it, it's just good to know how long is this going to last <laughs> and how soon is it going to be before we've used this commodity up. That helps us to know how much to purchase and how much to store away in the pantry. Now, when we're looking at pantry space, we always think out at least three months. So for instance, it would be really, and I mean really unusual for us to just have one container of coffee on the shelves in that pantry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I should go back and count, but there are several. I'm just going to say several. I think we're down to two. <laughs> oh, no. I just had to put one out, so oh, we are down to two. Time to, to two. get another one. <laughs> but we purchased those in July, so they're doing pretty good. <laughs> so, so we know about how long that two-pound bag of coffee beans is going to last us. That's why that second date is so important, because you need to know, wait a minute, co let's say coffee lasts you for one month, just arbitrarily. Uh, you're going to want to have three containers of coffee on your shelf at all times because remember, we're prepping for at least three months at a time. And let me say that you mentioned something about the coffee that's a very important factor. You said yes. coffee beans. Coffee beans last longer than ground coffee. I think it's about twice as much shelf life as ground coffee. So if you have ground coffee, especially if it's in those kind of paper bags, you'll want to use that up once you get it unsealed. The same with ground canned coffee. You don't want to keep that around forever. So, but the beans, if you have a coffee grinder, and you can buy those, they're pretty inexpensive. Those will last you quite a bit longer. They're more shelf stable. And speaking of cans and bags, we're going to cover this in just a sec. We want to make sure you stay with us because toward the end of the video, remember, we're going to cover those five golden rules for storage. We're going to tell you the difference between what you do with a can and what you do with a bag because there is a difference in how you process it and how you store it. So make sure you stick around with us. Let's give another example of a real good shelf stable yes. item and that is dry beans. Now, how long do dry beans last on average? Oh, like a long time. I'm going to say two years. Wow. They don't two years. Techni technically, okay, wow. technically, they don't go bad. They do get kind of dried, kind of shriveled. They might be kind of tough, but t in a technical sense of the word, there's not much in a dried bean to actually go bad and be inedible. See, I didn't know that. I don't know beans. <laughs> Alrighty, so that kind of covers shelf stability. Ask yourself these questions and say, how shelf stable is it? And is this going to last as long as I need it to on my shelf? Yeah. Second criteria you want to take into consideration is versatility. Very, very important when you were looking at a prepper pantry. Now remember, prepper, we're talking at least three months at a time. We're not talking 10 years at a time or even a year at a time. Let me give you the best example I, I know. Um, rice. White rice is incredibly versatile. White rice will last you for a long time it, on that pantry it shelf. Has more, it's more shelf stable than brown rice, mm -hmm. I understand. Brown rice has the, the outside, the exterior of the grain still intact. It has the endosperm. It's not been polished. And so it actually is not a shelf stable. It lasts six months on your pantry shelf, whereas white rice will last a year or two on your pantry shelf. And so there's a difference between those two as far as shelf stability is concerned. But white rice in general or brown rice, whatever you want to cook, rice is very versatile. You can use rice for a whole lot of things. Whereas if you buy those itty bitty rice side dish packets, mm -hmm. not versatile. What else are you going to use them for? It's a side dish. It's well, prepackaged. Yeah, they're they're pretty much locked into what they're designed for. Not only that, it is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly expensive, expensive <laughs> compared to just buying rice as opposed to the pre-made rice packet. Mm -hmm. Here's a rule of thumb, guys. Anytime you buy something where somebody else has done the majority of the work for you, you're going to pay a whole lot more than if you're buying a single mm -hmm. ingredient whole 
food. That is probably one of the major tips that we can give you as far as putting things in your emergency pantry. You have got to get used to thinking in terms of single ingredient foods. When you put something on your shelf, it's just rice. It's just beans. It's just a vegetable. It's just a canned fruit. It's That's all that's in there is just that one item. Because first of all, it's gonna cost you less. And secondly, it's gonna be far more versatile and you can make far more out of it. You have to consider versatility. Yeah, and I think uh, those items are much better for you mm -hmm. if you're buying a single ingredient item than something that's been processed that has a lot of preservatives, salt, what have you, food coloring, you know. <laughs> the third criteria you wanna take into consideration, we got shelf stability, we have versatility, and the third thing you wanna take into consideration is the cost per serving. Now, let's just compare for a second. Let's compare rice to quinoa. They're both single ingredient foods. They're both super good for you. In fact, we love quinoa. Quinoa is, is, is a complete protein, which for mm -hmm. vegans like us is like, that's the gold star, right? <laughs> uh, but it's far, far more expensive than rice is. So we have to take into consideration, do we have both in our pantry shelves? You betcha. Oh yeah. But do we have more rice than we do of quinoa? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> because rice per serving is far less than quinoa. So am I going to buy quinoa? Yeah, I probably am and still be able to fit it into my food budget. But am I going to buy 25 or 50 pounds of it? No, I'm not. But I'm going to buy at least 25 pounds of rice. Do you see the difference? There's still great food products. There's still whole foods. There's still single ingredient foods. But one is far more per serving than, than the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you want to be able to look at the total number of meals that you can get from that item. What is going to fill your family up more and keep them full longer? You need to look at that when you're considering whether you put something in your emergency pantry or whether you don't. Fourth and final criteria, and then we're going to move right into the five gold star standards for how you store this stuff once you decide what's coming into your pantry. You, right? Yeah, I was going to say, you have to consider <laughs> your family's preference on foods. If you're stocking items that your family is not going to eat, it's not going to do you much good to have those items now, is it? So you want to stock items that your family will be glad to be served at a meal. Look, I see so many well-meaning people who are like, you know, we really don't like beans, but I got beans in my emergency pantry because if something happens, they're going to eat beans. You know what the truth is? You probably won't. <laughs> It, it depends on how bad things get. I suppose, yeah. Look, if it's a zombie apocalypse, <laughs> yeah, yeah. maybe. But the truth is that you need to put stuff in your emergency mm -hmm. pantry that your family's actually going to eat. Because unless times get really, really tough, you're probably wasting your pantry space, your storage space is worth something to you, and you're wasting your time and you're wasting your money. And I hate wasting those three things. I don't know about anybody else, but I hate wasting those things. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you're buying stuff that your family actually enjoys. Now, this is my chance to put a plug in for the, the other two parts of this series that we're getting ready to record. Because when you get to the end of this three part series, not only are you going to know what to put on your pantry shelves, how to store them, but once again, let me remind you, I'm going to show you my five-step formula for how to create meals out of your pantry that are not only healthy, but your family is going to love to eat. And I'm going to show you how to figure that out ahead of time to make sure you got what you need in your pantry. All right, let's just roll right into how they store this stuff. Once they get it home, we're going to give you five overall gold star rules for how you want to store things in your pantry. Well, I think this first one is pretty common. In fact, you'll see this written on the outside of many packages, and that's that you want to store it in a dry place, you want to store it in a, a dark place, and you want to store it airtight. You want all three of those. That's right. We call these the commandments. It's the three commandments for food stories. <laughs> thou shalt store thy food in a dry place. Thou shalt store thy food airtight. And thou shalt store thy food in a cool slash cold space. <laughs> Let's talk about those just one at a time. All right. Now, do you want a freezing cold area? 
no. A lot of foods, even pantry foods, you don't want to go below like 32 degrees with it. Do you want it cool? Cool is considered somewhere between um, 45, 55 degrees. You want it cool. Think about the temperature that you would encounter if you have a cellar, a food cellar, which was so common, like, you know, 80, 100 years ago, everybody had a food cellar. But it was underground a few feet and it actually had a constant temperature down there of about 45, 55 degrees. That's what you're looking for, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, dark. Why do you want a dark space? Because whenever you have light emitting into an area, you're certainly creating a certain amount of heat along with that light. Along with light comes heat. You're heating up that food. And some foods you don't want to get real warm because it will tend to go rancid far more quickly. Airtight. This is where we give you the example of cornmeal and flour. The sacks that cornmeal and flour are sold in, are they airtight? No, they're not. No, it's mm -hmm. just a paper bag, basically. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be putting that just directly on your pantry shelf because it's not airtight at all all and certainly not bug proof all right so uh, so you want to go ahead and take those items out and you want to put them in something that's airtight you can put them in rubbermaid you can put them in tupperware you can put them in anything that's going to have a tight lid just put the whole bag in there if mm -hmm. you want or empty them out into that you can use freezer bags whatever you want and speaking of freezing some of these things uh, I'm going to digress just a little bit where we're talking about making things airtight and tell you that before you put that cornmeal and that flour into a container and just set it on your pantry shelf, there's something else that you need to do. There are four items that are prone to insect infestation, and right. that is rice, beans, pasta, and flour. So even if you get these from the store, you'll want to yeah. put those into a plastic bag and put them in a deep freezer and let them freeze for how long should they let them in there for? At least three days. Three days. And that should be at zero or below. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, put them in the freezer bag, stick them in the freezer. Make sure the freezer bag is closed and all the air is possible to get out of the bag. You've gotten out of the bag, put it in the freezer for three days, then take it out, let it come up to room temperature. Three days at zero or below will kill any um, meal moths that are in there or even their larvae of their eggs if those are in there. And it's very, very common. It's, it's incredibly difficult under any processing conditions to process all, all that stuff out of these products. It just happens. And we've had, has have you tell us in the comment section, have you had meal moths? Because we have, and we're pretty careful with this sort of thing. We've had them a couple of times. Uh, once you get them, they're hard to get under control. We got mm -hmm. them pretty quickly. We found them quickly and were able to, to locate exactly where they were coming from and, and uh, get the problem under control. But if you've ever had them, you know you don't want to have that problem. So <laughs> one way to avoid that, sub-zero temperature, zero or below for uh, three days, and then you can take it out and go ahead and put it on your pantry shelves. There's something else they can add to it though that actually is going to help them avoid this problem. Yeah, if they add bay leaves to the mm -hmm. top of their pantry or even if you put them just inside your plastic bag or you've got your flour, they will help detour pests. I have to give a shout out to y'all because several of our viewers are the ones, particularly um, we had several viewers from India. This is very common to be done in India. And I know the, that um, several of you all have said, uh, we use bay leaves and it works really, really well to deter insects. You can actually put a bay leaf, let's say you've got a big bag of rice, go ahead and put a couple of bay leaves on top of there. Every six months, you should go ahead and switch out the bay leaves and put new bay leaves in there. It will not scent your rice. Your rice is not gonna smell and taste like bay leaves. Um, but then they also, um, we had viewers that said, go ahead and put bay leaves like on the shelf of the pantry and it deters it deters insects. They don't like the smell of it and they go away. Where do you get bay leaves from? We don't happen to have a bay leaf tree out back. You can buy bay leaves at the grocery store. You can buy them at a bulk store. I, I get like big, big containers of bay leaves. I mean, okay. I cook with them some. Oh, but, I know it. I had one but, in my soup today. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> I guess I missed that one. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> missed picking that out of there. So uh, so yeah, I mean, you can get them. You can ba get bay leaves everywhere. So go ahead and put those in. 
Right. I think this next point you've touched on, and that's to not keep your cornmeal or flour in its original yeah. package. Uh, also, it will stay a lot longer. You'll, it'll last a lot longer if you put it in the freezer. It'll last a couple of years if you freeze it and just keep it there. Yeah, there's no law that says you ever got to take it out of the freezer, guys. You can leave your flour and you can leave your cornmeal just sitting in the freezer and it will last longer in the freezer up to two years rather than on your pantry shelves. Once you put it on the pantry shelves, you're looking, well, the experts say a shelf life of six months. Um, I have kept flour for up to a year. I got to be honest and it's mm -hmm. been perfectly fine. But I will tell you that food authorities uh, will tell you that six months is a real safe zone there for flour and cornmeal. And we are actually giving you these tips because we learned the, these hard, the way. hard way <laughs> yes, just did. this week. And I should, I apologize, guys. I We always are just real transparent with you when we screw up. <laughs> I should have had Larry take a photo before we threw it out because we just had to throw out some um, from flour, some flour and uh, f three or four weeks ago, I had to throw out some cornmeal because I had put it on the pantry shelf without following my own rules. <laughs> and I thought, oh, it'll be fine. It was not fine. And it was my fault. And I hate wasting food. I mean, Fortunately, I really yeah. hate wasting food. It wasn't very much, though. It was just a couple, I think it was just a two, pa pounds, two one pound but packages. But yeah, it had mildewed. The problem is our basement it, on that particular shelf in our back of our basement does tend to gather moisture a little bit and we weren't uh, very careful. We should have put it up higher too. That, that's the other thing we could have done. But, uh, but you'll have to kind of experiment around your house where the best place is to store these things. And you might find out that you've got a shelf that you maybe you shouldn't put it on. So once again, the criteria you're looking for though, just to remind you when you're looking for that space, you're looking for cool, dark, dry. Those are the three things that you're looking for uh, when it comes to pantry and food storage space. Then another suggestion along those lines, and I think we've already touched on it, is when you put canned goods, or frankly anything you put in storage, put a date on it. That will not only help you know how long you've had it in there, but let's just say you should find some more like items, then you can rotate those and put the newest dates to the back, the oldest dates to the front. So you're always pulling from those older dates. Reminder for you, this is the first in a three-part series. You want to make sure that you don't miss the, the other two parts of the series. So really, if you're not a subscriber, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the bell notification, and YouTube will let you know the minute that we drop the next video in this series. Another reminder for you, don't forget that freebie. Be sure to grab that pantry checklist. It's a little workbook for you, and it's a pantry stock up workbook. There's a link in the description of the video video. And remember, this whole series was spawned because incredible interest has been shown in our 20 essentials that you need to be stockpiling in your emergency pantry. I'm going to leave a link to that video right over there. And that's the next video that you should watch. And we'll see you Thursday for part two of this very important stock up prepper series.